Hello from Caterpillar Lab Studios. I've got a screen behind me linked up to a microscope that we'll be using to look at a lot of the creatures I want to show you. And we'll also do a lot of screen sharing uh, to look at photographs and videos. Um, so I'm hoping this is all going to work out pretty well. Uh, my main worry is that I won't have an audience in front of me to generously laugh at my jokes and, and make me feel more comfortable. <laughs> so I'm just going to pretend that lots of you are, are laughing at me. That makes me feel better. Um, we will our, laugh, we will laugh, we we'll will laugh. laugh. At you. It's, it's a perfect role. Um, around me uh, is the Caterpillar Lab. So there's the screen, we've got old natural history wall charts here, and I'm looking out at a room that has microscope stations, um, cages of caterpillars. Uh, what's over there? We've got some black swallowtails on host plant um, and an entire rearing room. This is a space that we do all kinds of things. We rear caterpillars here. We perform research, um, but over everything else, we put together our outreach programs and we host outreach here. In a normal year, we would have had groups coming in all summer long and all winter long to learn about these things, explore with us. Um, this year, it's been a little bit more quiet. Uh, so I've been focusing a lot on photography, on storytelling, and uh, hopefully on bringing moments like these, uh, presentations, um, workshops and even like school programs to people virtually. Um, although I have my fingers crossed that by next year we'll be out there in the field again and directly interacting with our audiences. So like me, uh, <laughs> a lot's changed at the Caterpillar Lab. You know, I began in those mucky swamps of, of Newton uh, right near Cold Spring Park, uh, spent a lot of time in that central pond looking at salamanders and aquatic insects. Um, sort of stubborn, didn't let that go. And I started the Caterpillar Lab here. And when the Caterpillar Lab started, I'm gonna share a screen here. It was mostly about the caterpillars themselves. Can everyone see that image? You good? I don't know if I get feedback from anybody, but um, right now- It's really clear, beautiful, clear image. Awesome. So at the beginning, it was all about the caterpillars. I took photographs of amazing native caterpillars. This is the Cecropia, about the size of a, a breakfast sausage. And I'm just gonna go through some of these um, caterpillars, which um, inspired me and certainly started to inspire everyone looking at these images. We would bring these caterpillars live to programs and just sort of try and get people's jaws to drop. I mean, to believe that such a creature as this existed near them such a leaf mimic as the four horned sphinx could be found in the local parks or something like the goldenrod um, shinia here could be on the flowers that they've taken for granted. This was very powerful. Um, we thought this reset how people saw the landscapes and open spaces around them, just knowing that creatures like this lived right nearby. Um, and this was fun. This was wonderful for many years just to introduce people to these caterpillars. But over those many years, we looked deeper and deeper at these creatures and at their stories. And especially with the beginning of our work with digital microscopes, we looked closer and closer. And we found that there was so much more to each of these caterpillars than just the caterpillar itself, its defensive adaptations and its host plants and how we see it at first. There is this whole world, this whole story revolving around them. And that's really what I want to get into tonight, um, not just the caterpillars, but the caterpillars and all their connections to the environment and creatures around them. And through that, use caterpillars as a way to approach sort of this big question of why does biodiversity actually matter? So everything we talk about tonight is going to be centered on a caterpillar, um, but I think the ideas are a lot bigger um, and uh, more impactful than they used to be. Not to say that we can't just spend a couple of hours appreciating caterpillars for being caterpillars. So to set the stage, um, the Caterpillar Lab sort of has a favorite quote. It's not strictly about caterpillars, but I'm going to read this out. Um, here we go. <laughs> Great fleas have little fleas upon their backs to bite them, and little fleas have lesser fleas, and so ad infinitum. And the great fleas themselves, in turn, have greater fleas to go on, while well, these, again, have greater still and greater still and so on. So I want you to think about this quote and these ideas as we go forward tonight, see if you can sort of figure out how it all relates. 
Um, but one of the most impressive things about this quote is that the original sort of influence for it was a poem by Jonathan Swift in 1733. And he's expressing this idea that everything is interacting, that things are using things or using other things, that our world is all connected. And I think we take this idea for granted nowadays. Most people walking down the street, seeing a little bug walking across a uh, slate of pavement, don't really recognize how that bug is keyed into everything else in the natural world around it. Um, but in 1733, that was an idea that, that held Jonathan uh, Swift's uh, mind. So we'll try and promote this. All right, so I'm gonna go to a live view again. So I'm stopping the share, hi again. And the way I wanna approach these big ideas, the way I wanna to prove to you that there's so much going on with Little Caterpillar is to tell some stories using my microscope. So let me turn this off. All right, so there's a story we were telling at our one and only outreach program this year up in Maine. We were doing a residency there that involves ants as sort of a starting point. So we're gonna start with some ants and see where that takes us. Um, the ants are one of my favorite little stories here. Um, you should be able to see we're looking at an acorn. This is a single acorn here. And within that acorn, we have acorn ants. I'm gonna zoom in. And I'm hoping this strategy will work that you guys can really see what's going on here on my screen. Within this single acorn, we have a colony of ants. At this time of year, rather than being full of, of workers and larvae, we actually have multiple queens. These are all queen ants that are gonna go out next year and form new colonies. But to get these ants in an acorn, a lot of things have to come together. I mean, they need an acorn, so where does that start? We need a forest with an oak tree that has enough resources, enough light, and enough time to grow up and become one of these monster oaks and start dropping acorns on the forest floor. Those acorns have to avoid being eaten by squirrels, but they actually have to be eaten by something to make an ant home. They have to be used by an acorn weevil. So the acorns are on the ground of the forest, acorn weevils come along and they drill a little hole into the acorn, lay an egg and their larva, the beetle grub, eats the inside of the acorn and hollows it out. And when it pops out of the acorn, it makes a perfect ant size hole. So basically the weevils are making little ant condos all over the forest floor. The ants move in, and once you have ants in an environment, everything changes. They act as sort of a keystone organism or a keystone group. Ants of any sort establishing in an area is gonna change the nature of the world around them. They're gonna be scavenging, they're predators, they're moving seeds around, and they're also allowing some creatures to exist in that forest that couldn't exist without them. So whether we're talking about acorn ants or another species, any of these need all these things to come together to exist. And when they're in that area, they change the nature of the world. So one thing they do is they interact with other insects. Um, one of those insects we have here. Let's see if we can look at these. All right. So this morning I went out and I found some alder branches to kind of bush. And on those alder branches, we found woolly alder aphids. So we're actually looking at living creatures right here. This is the alder branch and these massive bodies covered with hair are aphids that only feed on alders and they feed ants. They actually produce these little droplets of sugar. The ants find them, they drink the sugar and it's a pretty simple relationship. They get sugar from the aphids that they couldn't access otherwise, sugar coming out of the plant. And in return for getting that sugar, the ants actually just want the aphids to keep alive, stay alive so they can keep getting more of that sugar. So they protect them viciously. And when I find these colonies in the wild, especially in the summer, and I reach over to grab one, ants will coat my hands and start biting. So they're viciously defended. And with some studies done, it turns out without ants in the area, these aphid colonies decline and eventually cease to exist. So think about what it took just to get this fuzzy mass of aphids. You know, we needed ants to set up in an area. And in the course of acorn ants, we needed the oak tree, the acorn, the acorn weevil, the ants to come in, the ants to find the aphids, feed on them, set up this mutualism, and then finally, we could have these acorns. And that's not even thinking about the alder, which is a plant that is the only host of these aphids, and it needs all these things to survive as well. So just getting here, it's magnificent enough, all the interactions that have to take place. But of course, this isn't the end of it. I mean, we're the Caterpillar Lab, so let me share the screen again. I'm actually gonna take you back to a program from this summer where we discussed um, the same stuff going on, 
but we actually had the next player in the game. All right, so hopefully um, right now you're looking at a PowerPoint, and here I'm gonna bring you forward in the story from back in time. Hi everyone, just coming to you before our program starts today, I'm setting up the microscope fodder um, and had some visuals that I couldn't resist sharing with you all. So I'm gonna turn the camera around. This is a program up Here's in Maine our in August. Here's some of our woolly alder aphids, and we've got two carnivorous insects enjoying these aphids. I'm going to point it up at the screen here. We're going to see what we can find. So there's not much of the woolly alder aphids left, and we have our first beast here. This is a surfid fly larva, one of the hoverflies, and um, it's sort of amazing to watch. Um, it moves through the aphids. It doesn't have a head capsule like a caterpillar. So it just picks up the aphids with seemingly just a pointed mouth and starts chewing on them. Hopefully we'll get a better view of that in a minute. I'm going to turn our twig over. And we also had a rather large harvester butterfly caterpillar show up, seemingly overnight, where it must have shed its skin into a final instar. And this has been chewing on the remaining aphid here. It's quite a striking caterpillar. So this is the fun of the microscope for me and why I spend so much time here during a program. Is I get to see so many things that I've never seen before um, while we're talking to people. So it's sort of like we can bring that moment of discovery and the excitement of it as we're experiencing it to our audiences. Hi, buddy. So again, this is the harv um, harvester butterfly caterpillar, the only obligate predator caterpillar in North America. So it has to eat meat and it has to eat these woolly alder aphids. All right. Oops, let's not watch that again. All right, so I hope everyone was able to see that. Um, that was from a program earlier in the year in Maine, and those were woolly alder aphids that we found right outside the program. Um, we brought them inside, and all of a sudden, we had all these predatory insects swarming over the aphids, devouring them whole. Um, it led to quite a few shocking visuals. Um, on screen now is the harvester butterfly caterpillar, sort of isolated from everything else, and its prey. It's one host, the woolly alder aphid. Um, again, just take a minute to realize what it took to have something like this harvester butterfly caterpillar in the environment. All those stages, all those interactions, all those ingredients that had to come together to get this caterpillar. And of course, the caterpillars turn into butterflies. This is the harvester butterfly. Um, next to the acorns that in a way gave rise to it. Um, the butterflies themselves actually still need those aphids. Uh, this is not a species you'll see very often um, nectaring on flowers. This is a species that hangs out with those aphids, flies in and actually drinks that same honeydew that the aphids use to attract the ants. Um, I might not have mentioned that the ants don't eat the caterpillars because the caterpillars actually cover themselves with the dead bodies and fluff of the aphids they eat. So they're actually hiding from the ants, eating the aphids and gaining protection uh, that the ants are giving to the aphids. So there's a lot going on here. Um, and this just keeps going story after story. And I'm going to share a few more with you. And we're not done with ants yet. Um, this is a pair of butterflies here. These are the silvery blues uh, related to the harvesters, uh, little blue butterflies you see in spring. They lay their eggs on legumes. So we're talking about things like um, sweet clover and um, what's that stuff called? Uh, cow vetch. The caterpillars are on that and the caterpillars start to sing as they grow. They make these little grinding noises. And instead of needing the ants to take care of aphids, which they eat, these caterpillars directly interact with the ants. They sing to the ants, the ants come, and they feed the ants the sugar water, similar to the aphids. We originally thought this was another mutualism. This was caterpillars feed ants, ants protect caterpillars from predators. It turns out there's many more things going on. We've got another video for you, and um, I want to try and show you just how strange these interactions get. So here we see ants tickling the silvery blue caterpillar asking for food. Um, we can very easily get this set up at a program. Uh, we just put these caterpillars in with a few ants. The ants immediately go over to them and start tickling them. So I think one of the first views, yep, you can see the caterpillar actually feeding the ant sugar water. And this is where things get weird. The caterpillars don't just feed the ant sugar water, 
they feed them sugar water plus some other chemicals. And in fact, a chemical that takes the dopamine out of the ant brains. So they're feeding them something that makes the ants depressed. They're starting to manipulate the ants. This is not gonna be that pretty mutualism. Watch closely here. These little tentacles pop out of the caterpillar's rear end. After the ants have drunk from the caterpillar and lost their dopamine, the caterpillar inflates these tubes and maybe giving back to the ants something they lost, something to make them happy again. So the caterpillars are manipulating the ants. They're getting the ants addicted to this chemical and the ants really forget themselves. They take care of these caterpillars, they defend them viciously, and often they don't go back to the colonies, they don't take care of their queens, they just stay with the caterpillar as their sort of devoted army. Um, so already in these stories, just looking at ants and caterpillars, there's a ton of strange interactions happening that you may never guess about if you were just walking down a street looking at a tiny little slug caterpillar or butterfly caterpillar on the side of the road. All right, we're gonna go back, stop sharing here. Hello again. Um, is there someone I can check in with just to make sure that all the visuals have been working so far? The visuals have been magnificent, Sam. Very nice. well done. All right. Take so your time. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> so we've looked at the ants, the caterpillars, these strange interactions. Now I wanna get to something that's a little bit more standard, something um, involving caterpillars and their many, many predators and parasites. And I was lucky to find some pretty neat caterpillars uh, this morning that I weren't, wasn't really expecting to find. This is a piece of goldenrod here. So we're looking at a goldenrod flower. But on that goldenrod flower, there's something wiggling back and forth a little bit. I hope we can all make that out. So flowers all across here. And then right here, there's actually a caterpillar. It's called the decorator emerald. It's an inchworm that eats these flowers, but every once in a while, instead of eating a petal, it just takes the petal and it glues it, glues it to its back. Let's see if we can get a better view of one of these. We'll zoom in some more. Hope you can make out sort of the skin of the caterpillar here. The head is over here and all the flowers it's put on its back. So this species is able to adapt its camouflage to whatever flower it's on. The moth may lay eggs on a goldenrod and the caterpillar will be able to be yellow. It may uh, lay eggs on verbena and the caterpillar will put purple flowers all over its back or very commonly daisy fleabane, it'll have these long white petals all over its back. So this is a great camouflage, but still, of course, things are gonna eat this caterpillar. Large ones might get eaten by birds, um, but at this scale, usually it's not the birds that are making a big difference in the populations. It's things called parasitoid wasps and flies. And I'm gonna share a plate. We've been making all of these natural history plates showing the life cycles of these caterpillars and all the things that are using them. We're up to 550 of these. And we're gonna look at this creature's life history. And we're gonna look at some of the things that use it, some of its whole story. So hopefully again, um, you've got a screen showing the beginnings of our plate here. And we're gonna zoom in towards the top left. And here you can see some hatchling decorator emeralds, a caterpillar that's just started to put the first petals on its back. We can move down with these happy caterpillars eating and putting ever more petals on their back. And here's a whole bunch of wild collected ones that have different flowers. So we've got goldenrod and we've got um, ragweed, which is always fun to collect these caterpillars for me. I'm quite allergic to ragweed. Um, bee balm over here. Uh, one where we took the petals off so we could see the actual form of the caterpillar. And finally, this really wonderful one with all this leaf material over it. So if everything goes well for this caterpillar, it's gonna pupate, become a pupa, and eventually we're gonna get this beautiful green moth called the wavy lined emerald. Um, these are actually really, really common caterpillars. These absolutely can be found in Newton. You wanna look for a, a waste area or just a, a vacant lot, we should say, maybe a power line cut find that daisy fleabane and goldenrod and look for the caterpillars on top of it. But not all of them are gonna become these moths. And actually, more often, we get things that look like this. We did a program a few years ago. We brought a ton of these caterpillars with us and they started disappearing. We thought they had walked off. In fact, they were being eaten by parasitoid wasps from the inside out. Um, but these wasps were really special. They're actually only using decorator emeralds and they use them in creative ways. This little blob is the body of a caterpillar. 
You might be able to see the head and legs over here. The body has become the cocoon of the wasp that ate it from the inside out. And still all over its back, we have the petals that the caterpillar gathered. So this wasp specializes on this caterpillar and what it gets from that is sort of the evolutionary knowledge that keeping its skin will keep the camouflage that the caterpillar works so hard to get so that the wasp would be camouflaged from its predators. And here's the wasp, it's called a campoplogene that emerges from that. To me, these parasitoids just make the caterpillars more astounding, more beautiful. It means that these caterpillars and their unique life histories are actually connected to so many other organisms and their life histories. And the stories, the interactions really never stop. So we had the caterpillar, it became the cocoon uh, with a pupa inside of this wasp that emerges. But sometimes when we collect these cocoons in the wild, instead of getting the right wasp that comes out of it, the Campoplogene wasp here, we actually get hyperparasitoids, which we can see over here. So these are chelcid wasps that came out of the wasps that came out of the caterpillar. And the longer we do programs, the more used to this we get. This is actually just standard stuff. We find caterpillars in the wild and, you know, 50% of the time we get a parasitoid wasp or fly emerging. We find uh, parasitoid cocoons and about 50% of the time we get a hyperparasitoid emerging. So like with the ants, uh, acorns, um, aphids, and caterpillars, uh, caterpillars are eaten by other things as well. We've got caterpillars, wasps, hyperparasitoid wasps, and so on. Nature is just full of an astounding level of these interactions. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing again for a moment, see where I'm at. All right, cool. So I want to move to sort of a deeper level of parasitism. I hope you guys are all okay with this. Um, usually before I show sort of a hard to take video, I'll do a poll in the audience and some of you guys will be making grossed out faces, um, which is sort of okay with me. Um, but to get deeper involved in parasitoids, we're going to look at a larger caterpillar. Um, one of my favorites, actually, it's called the fawn sphinx. It's sort of like your backyard hornworms, these species that eat uh, tomatoes and tobacco, but the fawn sphinx specializes on ash trees. That comes with its own problems. I'm sure many of you are aware of the emerald ash borer killing ash trees in New England. We're worried that these ash specialists are going to be wiped out by that as well. Um, but for now, we're going to look at the things that interact with fawn sphinx. So back to sharing again, back to our PowerPoint. Move forward just a little bit. So I'm sort of going to take a break here. I've got this video, uh, one of my favorites, uh, of something astounding that happened at the lab last year. I was videoing a caterpillar with parasitoid wasps emerging from it, and something else showed up on the stage. It's about five minutes, and I was considering breaking it up, but I just think it's a wonderful thing. Um, I'm going to stop sharing for a minute and make sure I do this right. Share screen. We're going to share computer sound because we've got some music to go along. And here we go. So enjoy, guys. <laughs>
I don't know if I was the only one sort of taking a break and dancing in the background, but uh, I love that video. Um, the story of it was just phenomenal. I was videoing the reconid wasp larva emerging from the caterpillar, um, and inside the lab, that hyperparasitoid wasp just flew in and started laying its eggs, um, and we were managed to record it. Um, those interactions, that whole scene, after all these years, I know it's shocking. Um, some people get a little grossed out by it, but to me now, it, it's just so meaningful that it's beautiful. Um, I think there was a line in there about things, using things, using things, using other things. And to me, um, these close interactions between specialists, the fact that that sphinx caterpillar has parasitoids and those have hyperparasitoids, um, that those wasps have lives of their own out in the world, maybe as pollinators, as food for other things, so the caterpillar is interacting with the host plants, uh, its specialist uh, on ash. All those interactions together equal something so big. It makes these tiny little caterpillars so much larger um, that they can support so much, that they interact with so much. Um, instead of being gross to me, um, or instead of being sad that this happens to caterpillars, it just makes me more in awe of all of it. Um, I'm going to share a screen to sort of drive that home with the species we were just looking at. Um, let me just find it here. Good. So right now you should be looking at a screen, um, a Photoshop document, our plate for the fawn sphinx that we just watched the video of. And you can see as it grows from a tiny little caterpillar on ash, getting bigger, shedding its skin, and finally becoming really one of this region's most spectacular, luminous, tropical-like caterpillars. Um, so this is a final instar, final growth stage fawn sphinx. Now, a few of these fawn sphinx will make it through. They're not all gonna get parasitized as we saw. Um, if they're healthy, if they haven't been used as a host, they'll pupate underground. Here's their pupa, the living middle stage of metamorphosis. And here's the adult moth. Now the caterpillar was eating ash trees. It was a herbivore. It was adding to our ecological world in that way. This moth is actually a pollinator. It has a long tongue. It hovers at flowers from spring through early summer, um, feeding and moving pollen around. Um, and it's food for other things as an adult, things that don't eat caterpillars like bats. Uh, but to get there again, it has to pass through many trials. This was a caterpillar we collected in the wild with these cocoons already on its back. That means that reconid wasps had fed on the inside of the caterpillar, they came out and they spun their cocoons, but we didn't get a single reconid wasp from this one. These cocoons opened up and they gave us a terramalid parasitoid wasps, only a few millimeters long. They also gave us that same uh, caterpillar from those same cocoons, a tiny little ichneumonid wasp, maybe two and a half millimeters long. Um, these are wasps that fed on the wasps that fed on the caterpillar. And if that wasn't enough, there was also a parasitic fly that had used this caterpillar and came out when the wasps were emerging. This is a tachinid fly. 
Um, native tachinids use lots of different caterpillars. They're often specialized, and many of these tachinid flies are pollinators, um, especially of things like goldenrods and asters. So that is, again, a lot going on, a lot of things using other things, a very big world in each little caterpillar. Let's see where we're at. Oh, good. Um, so it looks like I've still got some time to continue and tell you some more stories. So we're going to go back to the microscope for a little while. Um, we've been looking at all these caterpillars that are on the outside of things. Uh, you're probably used to seeing some of them, eating your plants, um, feeding on leaves, uh, or even maybe feeding on aphids. But there may be more species of caterpillar that instead of feeding externally, actually feed on the inside of plants. Things that are mining into stems, creating galls, or even living just within a single leaf. And that's what we're going to look at here. I'm going to turn on a backlight because what we're going to try and do is peer into something just like this. This was a leaf that I collected this morning. It had a little green patch in all that yellow. And that green patch was maintained by a leaf mining caterpillar. Um, it used chemicals to keep that green even after the leaf was mostly dead, so it had a place to feed. So let's try and do this. This is sort of advanced microscoping, so you might have to bear with me just a little bit as I find our creatures. One of the really great thing about things about these little leaf mining caterpillars is they are everywhere. You can go outside any time of year and find things like this. All right, so we're just starting to see this. Don't worry, I'm going to zoom in. Here's our green patch, and within that we've got a mine. An egg was laid right here, and caterpillar bored through the leaf, inside the leaf, eating and pooping until it got nice and big, <laughs> slash just a couple of millimeters long, and here it is eating in the leaf right now. Let's go even closer. All right, not the most perfect lighting, but I think you get the idea. This is a caterpillar inside the leaf eating only a few cells at a time. So this is already magnificent to me. I mean, all you have to do is look out a window um, in summer, I guess, and see all the different trees, all of the different plants, all of those thousands and thousands of leaves, and suddenly realize that all those native plants have leaf miners that use them of different species. Some plants have dozens of species of leaf miners that use them. So in those leaves, we've got creatures that already makes those trees so much bigger. But this isn't the end of a leaf miner story. They're eating, they're pooping, they're specialized on their leaves. But of course, there are parasitoids that specialize on these caterpillars inside their leaves. And I was very lucky to find one of those as well. So we're gonna zoom back out and look at another of the same species here. We've got three different mines on the screen. We have one where an egg hatched, the caterpillar crawled around feeding and pooping and got to this point where it cut a circle out of the top surface of the leaf, cut a, surface, a circle out of the bottom, silked them together into a little envelope and fell in their cocoon to the forest floor where they'll overwinter. We've got another where the egg hatched, caterpillar grew, and here's the final stage caterpillar getting ready to do the same process. But in the middle, we have one that never developed fully. I'm gonna zoom in on that. There we go, I hope people will be able to make this out pretty well. So here is the dead body of one of our leaf mining caterpillars. And this actually happened during a program years ago. We were watching a caterpillar eating, munching around, pooping behind it, and then it died by the end of the day. It's a little awkward when you have a room full of second graders, but uh, natural. Um, but something was still moving inside that dead caterpillar. And we watched it for a few days and eventually something just like this popped out. Can you guys see the motion here? That's worth zooming in on. So some of you have probably already guessed what this is. This is the larva of a parasitoid wasp, a wasp that knew that its host was inside of a cherry leaf at this time of year, knew how to locate it through vibration or chemistry, use its ovipositor, a stinging-like egg-laying tube to inject an egg into its body, grow up inside, emerge, and pupate for next year. So, Again, just sort of, I hope you're all thinking back on that initial poem. I mean, this is a wasp inside of a caterpillar, inside of a single leaf. And all you have to do is think of the world around you, the landscape of all these different species of trees and plants, 
that all have the potential just to have this going on in a single leaf. It's awe-inspiring, it's overwhelming. Just get back to our share here. Sorry guys, there we go. So we've talked a lot about these tiny specialist interactions, one after another after another. I mean, just looking at what can come from an acorn or what can come from a single leaf. Um, but you really can't deny, oh, sorry, there we go. An acorn is just a small part of a much bigger story. So we had this huge story, acorn, acorn ants, aphids, caterpillars, but just look up from those acorns and you've got this magnificent thing, this super organism, an oak tree. You've got the trunk, you've got the branches, you have the wood, you have the bark, you have thousands and thousands of leaves. And all of that is supporting a myriad of insects, herbivores, wood borers, all of those have their parasitoids and hyperparasitoids. The galls on the leaves have their wasps and flies which eat those. Um, we've got birds and vertebrates and everything interacting all around this one tree. We want people to leave our programs. I wanna leave you guys with some problems when you're walking around the neighborhood. I want you to see an oak tree and just be floored and have to sit down because what a single oak tree in a Newton neighborhood represents is immense. There's so much going on. And again, you take a step back and oak trees are by no means the only tree in the forest, the only plant around. Across a landscape or in a dingy vacant lot, a tuft of grass behind the CVS, or certainly in the entirety of Webster Woods or, or Cold Spring Park, there is more going on than we can hold in our minds. I like to say it's, you know, it's as hard to really hold in our minds um, what's going on in the natural world, the sheer volume of diversity, as it is to sort of consider the infinite universe and the beginning of time. I know my father, the physicist, is watching this tonight, so he might disagree or agree. We'll see. All right, so I want to take a minute, I'm um, going to go back and stop sharing, to sort of wrap up all the stories we've been going over and look at their common themes. I mean, what's the common theme, right? Just so much incredible diversity, but it's not just diversity in species. It's not just diversity in the number of animals and plants and fungi. It's diversity, it's a biodiversity of interactions. We have so many things interacting with so many other things all the time, things using things using things. These are all checks and balances. These are creatures moderating each other. This is making growth more predictable. It means our environment with all these interactions healthily taking place can be productive and can be predictable year to year. I mean, why do you think there's sort of always enough leaves for the caterpillars? and rarely too many caterpillars for all the leaves, and enough caterpillars for all the parasitoids, and enough caterpillars for all the birds. Why does it all work? It works because of one of nature's greatest strengths, this diversity of interactions. The more interactions, the more checks and balances, the more regular, dependable, predictable nature becomes. It's a nice environment, nice dependable environment for things to evolve against and live year to year against. That's the strength of nature. That's the strength of biodiversity. That's why it matters. But the problem is it's also a great weakness because you introduce us, human beings, and we really know how to mess things up. We make change too fast. We introduce a non-native plant or a non-native insect, and we start messing with those connections, making them less effective. We bulldoze an environment, and we remove so many of those connections, making the whole system less effective. We change climate too rapidly. Winners and losers all over the place, rapid change, disrupting those connections. And again, making the environment less dependable year to year, making some of our native species act badly in those times because suddenly we remove those checks and balances. So we wanna see this everywhere. We do see this everywhere, but we wanna maintain this in our environments, around our houses, everywhere we can so that nature continues to function healthily. So we're going to go back and look at a few examples of creatures um, that sort of relate well to this. Hold on one moment. Perfect. 
So before I sort of wrap up, I want to just put this new information to use, you know, keeping in mind all of those connections, interactions, the stability they create. What now can we learn? What, how can we put this to use when looking at something like the creature on the screen now? Um, this is not a native creature, it's the gypsy moth, an invasive species introduced to the United States um, well over 100 years ago now. This creature, it's not a bad insect. Um, actually, where it came from, where it's native, where it has a myriad of interactions with parasitoids and predators, this creature is an ecological good guy. It's adding to those systems, the systems that it evolved in. But introduced to New England, the reason it's a problem is it's isolated from all of the stories, all of those interactions we've been talking about today. It stands alone. And no creature can stand alone and either persist or not become a problem insect or animal in the environment or plant. So the gypsy moth, it eats too much. It eats too much year after year after year without those checks and balances. People introduced some checks and balances through biocontrol, a tachinid fly, a lot of pathogens. Some have done great things for managing the gypsy moth, some have backfired. Um, those mean that gypsy moth populations now sort of go like this. We have our break from them and then they have their spikes. But if this was really in balance, we'd see a lot more of this, a gypsy moth population that is manageable, that is predictable. So these non-native creatures don't fit into the context of the whole story that we've been talking about. And that's one of the major reasons they do damage. So this is just a little picture from nearby this uh, last couple of years. Now, I don't want you to think that all caterpillars eating a lot is necessarily a bad thing. Again, it has a lot to do with whether they're native or non-native. This is actually one of my favorite native caterpillars. This is the Eastern tent caterpillar. So using that whole story idea, looking for connections, we can see something like the Eastern tent caterpillar as more than a defoliator, but as actually an ecological good guy. And they eat a ton of plants. They've evolved with those plants. Um, cherries have become pretty toxic. They actually have all the ingredients of hydrogen cyanide in their leaves. And the caterpillars have actually ended up putting that to use. The caterpillars are full of hydrogen cyanide themselves. Um, pretty toxic and hard to eat. But um, as a native caterpillar, a lot of things have evolved to use these as well. Um, there are two wonderful birds, uh, the black-billed and yellow-billed cuckoo which love eating these tent caterpillars. A lot of birds can't handle them because of the cyanide and because of all the hairs all over their body, which irritate birds' stomachs. But the cuckoos have evolved to be able to eat them. They eat whole nests at a time, and then they just regurgitate their stomach lining and get rid of all that hair. On top of that, um, there are just countless, countless parasitoids, um, even over 100 species of just ichneumonid wasps that use tent caterpillars as hosts. So all of these checks and balances are in place. They are a boomer bust species. Species like this uh, forest tent caterpillar can totally defoliate areas some years, but within a year or two, the parasitoids and predators, they build up their population using these caterpillars and what was a high population dips again. And they've actually looked at forests that were allowed to be defoliated this once or twice out of every 10 to 20 years and the outcomes down the road are healthier. The forests end up being healthier because they were defoliated. These caterpillars act as a low-grade wildfire. They come through and they kill the weakest one to three percent of trees. Those understory trees that weren't going anywhere, the older trees that weren't very productive. Um, these were all tested because they tend to eat sugar maples. So it was shown that sugar maple um, production was higher in forests where these were allowed to defoliate. So we had a non-native species that eats a lot and causes environmental damage. We have a native species which seems to eat in the same way, but it can't defoliate year after year. It's well ingrained in all those interactions we were talking about, and it's actually an ecological good guy, even if it occasionally eats your favorite cherry tree in the backyard. Now for time, I'm gonna skip this whole discussion of tobacco hornworms, uh, another one of my favorite caterpillars that have a long, old evolutionary uh, relationship with tomato plants that pollinate some of those same plants as adult moths and that have more than their fair share of parasitoids um, that use them as well and help control them year to year so that their numbers don't totally overwhelm their resources. So just another native caterpillar, um, which is important in our ecosystems, even if it's not one of our favorite if you're trying to grow tomato plants. 
So um, I'm going to stop talking eventually. Um, but at the end here, I just wanted to throw out these, these three ideas um, and hopefully get some questions surrounding them. Um, putting all this to use, here's what I think is most important. I think the first step is educating and making our population aware of everything I've just talked about. They need to know this is all there and around them, in their backyards, in Cold Spring Park, the side of the road, and yes, in the forests of Western Massachusetts. People have to realize that diversity is there to celebrate it and to want to conserve it. After that, I really want to drive home that for us at the Caterpillar Lab, uh, anything I would recommend for gardening or landscaping, it's going to all be about biodiversity above all else. There's a lot of catering to favorites these days, um, and it helps get people involved. Favorites like the monarch butterfly, favorites like uh, pollinating bees. But if we only focus on those, we're seeing some missed opportunities. Um, actually, we can't maintain healthy bee populations or healthy monarch migrations if we don't manage our areas to be incredibly biodiverse and healthy. It's every player. It's the wasps, it's the bees, it's the flowers and the native weeds. It's the oak tree above it all, and it's definitely the thousands upon thousands of caterpillars eating all of that green. Um, finally, uh, we have these spaces around us, and managing those species, spaces, thinking about them differently, that's our chance to do some help, do some good. Whether your space is your backyard, whether you've got a roadside near you, whether there's even a patch of weeds behind the CVS across the street from you, um, or whether it's the entire Cold Spring Park, the aqueduct, or again, a, a national forest. Um, these are places that we can manage with biodiversity in mind. Not pick favorites, but encourage a diverse landscape of plants, um, crazy early successionary edges, um, old forests um, that have all these players coming together. In our yards, we can leave some areas with leaf litter and rotten woods, a tangle of weedy plants, our job being mostly to remove invasive species that would take down the value. And just think about Newton for a while, because it is beyond the parks and it's beyond the backyards. There are just so many in-between spaces that if they looked like the in-between spaces we have up here in New Hampshire would absolutely change the landscape and fauna scape um, of, of your town. Um, a roadside in New Hampshire is filled with native plants, blueberries, cherries, um, oaks crawling all over each other. Um, the invasive plants haven't set in here. Let's make more of Newton, more of those in-between spaces support all the things we'd like to see around here. Um, so that's basically the end of my talk, but I'm hoping, I know we don't have that much time, but I'm hoping I can be here for questions and really go into a lot more.